welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by SchoolofLaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast. Rick Roberts here today. Hope you're having a good one wherever you are doing whatever it is that you do. I'm feeling pretty good this morning. Got up, did a little mountain biking, did five miles on some switchback trails on a mountain bike course. Check this out. That's less than a mile from my house. That's 10 miles in total if you do the whole thing. And I've been driving past that thing. Didn't even know it for almost 12 years. Isn't that sad? I had no idea it was there. It was right across from the boat ramp. It's back in the woods. Never went down that street. 12 years. Thank you, COVID. I'm saying that true because, you know, had I not had this break in the action from traveling, I would not have slowed down and started doing other things to uh, just occupy my time a little bit, get healthy. I've been riding a bike, mountain biking on some days, uh, going for longer rides than others. Uh, just knocked out a 60 miler last weekend uh, from my house all the way down to Nashville, around the corner of Nashville and back. Uh, 60 miles, man, which is the equivalent of going for where I'm at on the, uh, where am I? I'm on the east side of Nashville, way out past the airport, the equivalent of biking from there all the way into Bowling Green, Kentucky. <laughs> so it's getting a little crazy. But again, had this uh, slowdown not happen, and I'm, I'm not happy that it happened, uh, obviously, because a lot of people are sick from it and, if, and some have died. But um, I'm thankful for the time home with my family and for uh, getting healthy and, and doing things like mountain biking this morning and slowing down enough to see turtles, but going fast enough to almost uh, blow my head off on a tree. So get out there, do it. Today is yours, man. Carpe diem. Or as Chris Spire says, car payment do them. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, that's enough rambling, but I wanted to just say, uh, take some time to do some stuff out there. It's not all grind it out and go to the next show. Although, today's guest makes you feel, I don't know, both inspired and yet uh, makes me aware of how much more I'm capable of doing. Our guest today is Dan Meyer, uh, and I met Dan over, uh, I guess he reached out online wanted to take the writing class back in March or April, and we connected that way. And uh, then I learned more about what he did, and I'm just fascinated. He he uh, he says he, he kind of grew up as a, a scared, shiny, skinny, wimpy kid and, and got beat up by the bullies. But, you know, he didn't get discouraged by that. He actually convinced himself that one day he'd perform superhuman feats and do the impossible and try to change the world. And guess what? I think he did. Because uh, today he travels the world. He mixes danger and laughter and swords, sword swallowing and defies death with a smile. As he does it, he inspires audiences to do the same thing with their lives. It's pretty incredible. He's performed uh, not just in 50 states, 50 countries, and was given the title of World's Top Sword Swallower by Ripley's Believe It or Not. Believe it or not. He has 40 world records. And you may already know Dan and not know that you know him. His uh, TED Talk went viral, cutting through fear. It's been translated into over 80 languages and is the most translated TED Talk in the world. So I'm done pumping him up. He's going to give us some stuff to think about. I really like what he's done with this uh, show. It's not just about him at all. It's about the transformation of his audience, and he takes them on a journey, which is very cool. So uh, let's get into it now with Dan Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R, in case you want to look him up real quick. Uh, He's at Cutting Edge Entertainment, C-U-T-T-I-N-G, Edge Entertainment, I-N-N-E-R-tainment. Inner, like there's a sword in my mouth. Let's get into it. Well, I am on the call today, and I think he's got a sword out of his mouth so he can talk on the other side. It's Dan Meyer. What's going on, man? Hey, Rick. Good to see you. Oh, he's, he's holding up his mask right now, which has a sword going down his mouth. That's great. That's a conversation starter or ender, depending on who you're talking to. Man, I was looking at your uh, website here a little bit just to see some more of the stuff you've done. You've been doing this for a while, and you've been all over with it, and you even 
you had a musical life before you got into all this trickery and stuff, right? I, I worked there in Nashville. I lived in, uh, in Antioch and worked in the music business and copyright licensing for many years uh, from about uh, 88 to uh, almost 2010, 11. And now I'm out in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's 109 degrees today, expected high of 115, 118 today. It's unbelievable, man. I mean, and you started texting me these uh, these temperatures like two or three weeks ago. So this has been like almost a solid month of just cake and bake out there. It is. It's actually, I think we've hit a world record. It's like 35, 36 days that we've been over 110 degrees uh, record since the 1890s. So it's kind of crazy. Well, you know what? Speaking of world records, <laughs> I know you've got a couple uh, you want to tell me about which, which one or two may have been the hardest to do or hardest to pull off or most competitive, you know, which cha- I guess the biggest challenge maybe. Oh gosh. It had to be in March of 2013. The Guinness world record was 21 or 22 swords at one time. And I broke it by doing 29. Uh, and then I didn't submit it to Guinness. I've got it as a record with uh, a couple other record companies, but I didn't get to submit it to Guinness because I didn't have the, the affidavits and the judges and all that kind of thing. And another guy has now broken it with 29 records and submitted it officially. But that was that was my biggie. And when you say 29 at one time, this is 29 swords in your mouth at the same time? At the same time, 24 inch long swords, about a millimeter in thickness, each of them. And they fanned out from the left side of my mouth to the right side of my mouth uh, into a big kind of bouquet of swords. Uh, I'll send you a picture later. Sounds like you could be a sponsor for the new Peacock app with that from <laughs> NBC. <laughs> that is incredible, man. So I got a million questions about this sword swallowing. To me, you know, I'm sure there's skeptics. People, unless you're right there and you can see the sword, they're like, oh, this thing's got a spring in it or something like that. Have you had people watch it and still not believe it? All the time. When I first started... Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of history, but 1997, I heard there were less than a dozen sword swallers left in the entire world. And I started practicing in my bathroom in Nashville. And a quick backstory before that is the first 20 years of my life, I grew up with extreme fear. I couldn't talk. I stuttered. I would tremble and shake. The bullies would tease me and beat me up. And so the first 20 years of my life, uh, I, I, you know, I was kind of a, a loser, just beat up by the bullies. And when I was 21, I went to India as a missionary, as a Lutheran missionary, for about a year, almost died of malaria fever uh, the week before my 21st birthday. And the night before my 21st birthday, I prayed a little prayer, and I said, God, if you take this fear from me, I will not let fear rule my life any longer. I want to take on risks and challenges. I want to find my purpose and calling. I want to know my life has meaning. I want to do something really remarkable with my life and somehow change the world. I want to prove the impossible is not impossible. And uh, I won't tell you if I survived or not, <laughs> but uh, that night I made a list of 10 things I wanted to do with my life. If I survived, I wanted to visit all the seven wonders of the world, uh, live on a ship on the ocean, uh, li- visit all the major continents, live on a deserted island, live with a, uh, work with a circus, live with the tribe of Indians, work in the music business in Nashville, uh, climb to the top of the highest mountain in Sweden, jump out of an airplane and see Mount Everest at sunrise. I think those were the first 10. And I thought, there's no way that's going to happen. I was a poor kid from Indiana. And uh, after, I, after I survived, got back from India, I ended up moving to the Bahamas, lived on a little island there for seven years uh, by myself in a thatch hut, uh, lived spearing sharks and stingrays for food. And then from there, moved to Mexico, moved to Ecuador, eventually moved to Nashville, worked uh, with CSAC in the music business, uh, down on Music Row there in Nashville. And then from there... You know, God has just opened doors and one thing has led to another. So that's kind of the surprising twist in my life is that I started out in fear and God turned things around. And, you know, people say, well, did you grow up in a circus? You know, are you a daredevil? I'm like, no, just the opposite. I grew up in fear and now God's taken this to where I can do it all over the world in 50 countries around the world. And that's the real miracle to me. But um, to get back to your question. 97, I heard there were, that was just kind of the progression. I, I started working as a clown, worked with different circuses as a clown, fire eater, stilt walker, juggler, rode elephants. 
And uh, in 97, when I heard there were less than a dozen sword swallowers, I began practicing 10 to 12 times a day, every day, in my bathroom. And it took four years, about 14,000 unsuccessful attempts before I got the first sword down, February 12, 2001. And that was uh, that was a trip. And then after that, I started touring with Brooks and Dunn and just started doing the Ripley's and the Guinness and eventually quit the music business and have been doing the sword swallowing pretty much full time since about 2001. And uh, it, now it's just been my full time career up until this whole COVID thing kind of knocked everything out of 2020. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's been, it's been a ride. Well, let me ask you this. Did you see more sharks in the Bahamas or on Music Row? <laughs> ah, good, good, good comedy <laughs> parallel there. Um, I actually saw more sharks on Music Row than I did in the Bahamas. That's that's great, man. So I just like the fact, you know, to make a list is a great thing. To actually put it to, you know, go out and conquer it is another thing. I wonder how often um, how often you recalibrate your list and say, oh, for the next 10 years, this is kind of what I'm thinking, or the next 10 things. Uh, every, actually, it's almost every every day, every week, every month. Uh, I recalibrate my list. So those first 10, every time I would accomplish one thing and check one thing off my list, I'd add five or 10 more things onto my list. So the list continued to grow. And if you want to see the list, it, it, I haven't updated it in a while, but it's called Throms, T-H-R-O-M, as in Mary, E-S, dot com, Throms, dot com. And a throme is something that I heard about that week before I had the malaria fever. It's like a, a major major life goal, major quest. If you, my, my buddy who was a missionary with me said, do you have thromes in? I said, thromes, what are those? He said, it's like <laughs> a major life goal. And I thought, no, no way, man, I'm too scared. I'm too chicken. You know, I'm, I grew up in fear and making that, those thromes. I mean, it's not the magic pill that, that does it, but it gives you something to shoot for. So I have maybe a thousand thromes out there. And every time I go to another country, so I moved to from the music business in Nashville, I moved to the music business in Sweden. <coughs> and uh, I want, uh, you know, from there I, I like, well, I want to go over and see Finland. I want to see Norway. I want to see Iceland. I want to see Russia. I want, you know, one thing led to another and you always want to see over the next horizon or like with the sword swelling, you do one thing. Like I could do one sword. I thought, well, maybe I could do two or maybe I could do three or five or 10 or whatever. And, and so you just kind of keep, stretching those goals, those thrones. Uh, a few years ago in 2008, I had the opportunity to meet the top TED speaker in Sweden. I went back to Sweden and met Hans Rosling. And he said, you need to do a TED talk on sword swallowing as, you know, the, uh, as the president of the Sword Swallowers Association, kind of world's leading expert on it. He said, you need to do one on sword swallowing. And I thought, people don't care about sword swallowing. Nobody's going to watch a TED talk on sword swallowing. So, and this is where we kind of get into the comedy thing. I, I did a twist on it. Instead of making it about sword swallowing, I made it about fear and overcoming fear. And at the end of the TED Talk, I kind of do that twist, that paradigm shift, that, that uh, surprise, unexpected surprise that the audience doesn't expect. And I pull out a sword and swallow a sword at the end of it. And it sent the whole video viral. And I've, I've ended up doing nine TED Talks on four continents so far. And just been a total blessing. But my my number one uh, TED talk is called "Cutting Through Fear" at TEDx Maastricht, and it's at like 1.6 million views. And it's just it people get kind of inspired by it, but it also kind of tells my whole backstory and and how I got into doing uh, uh, sword swelling. That's awesome, man. And another thing you said a little bit earlier that I didn't want to get too far away from is that you had. 14,000 unsuccessful attempts. And before that, you said that there was only 12 sword swallowers left in the world. So I was, I was wondering, was that number really big? And then a lot of them f injured themselves along the way during their 14,000? Or was it just, you knew about 12, you wanted to be the 13th? And then also, you know, at some point, you know, maybe the 9,000th try, you're like, yeah, maybe this is it for me. You know, a throne to me sounds like something that would get a, a, a soreness on your throat. It sounds like something that a sword swallower would get. It's, I've got a throne in here somewhere. We call those sword throats. Sword uh, throats. SW, sword ah, that's throats. great. <laughs> How do you keep yourself positive? Yeah, when I first, uh, you know, I, I met a few sword swallowers. I met a guy named George the Giant. Uh, he was in Nashville, and he came to our jug. I ran the Nashville Jugglers Club for many, many years down on Centennial Park. And he came one Tuesday night 
And I heard he was a sword swallower. I said, I said, George, give me some tips. He said, I'll give you two tips. Number one, it's extremely dangerous. 29 people have died doing it. Number two, don't try it. <laughs> well, I, you know, that didn't dissuade, persuade, dissuade me. I just, uh, I added it to my list of thrones. I thought, okay, I got to do this and start practicing. And when he said there were less than a dozen, I thought, well, I got to track these guys down and started asking them tips and questions. Nobody would give me any tips and uh, tried to read. There aren't very many books out. There was one in 1950 called Step Right Up by Daniel Mannix. And I studied that and everything, every photo I could get. And I amassed about 10,000 photos of sword swallowers. But to answer your question, sword swallowing was it got to be pretty big in the United States after the 1893 World's Fair in in Chicago, and then again the World's Fair of 1935, and then from the 1930s to the 1940s or 50s, almost every circus and sideshow had a sword swallower. So it got to be fairly, you know, there were a few um, a few hundred of them over over history, but in the 1950s and 60s the the circuses started to die down. They started cutting out their sideshows. Ringling Brothers cut out theirs uh, in the 60s. And so in the, the, the actual last sword swallower that worked with the circus was 1972. And he died when one of his uh, neon swords exploded inside of him. He got pneumonia and died of it. So, uh, you know, after the 70s, it started to dwindle and was kind of an old bygone kind of thing. Now we're up to a few dozen sword swallers that are professionals actively performing around the world today. And I started doing a thing with uh, Ripley's called World Sword Swallowers Day. So every, the last Saturday of every February, we would have World Sword Swallowers. And we'd all get together at the different Ripley's and swallow swords together. It was kind of our, our big club kind of thing. Uh -huh. And that was, that was a lot of fun. But uh, so we're up to a few dozen sword swallowers now. It's people with the YouTube and, and the internet. People can watch videos and kind of study each other a little bit more that we couldn't do back in the old days. So it's kind of progressed a little bit more, but I like to take it beyond just a circus sideshow act. And I like to put a lot of comedy into the first third of my act, a lot of education in the middle third, and then kind of go for the heart, go for the, the, the spirit, the soul in the, the last third. And I, so I, I perform at a lot of churches, a lot of upward, unlimited, uh, probably 60% of my shows are Christian shows. Uh, outreaches, uh, missions outreaches in Africa or Fiji or India. And it attracts a crowd. And then you can, we can give a, a, a message at the end. And sometimes that message is a gospel message. Sometimes it's a, an inspirational message or a corporate message, kind of like what you do. You know, you can take your, your comedy and put that on the front end to get people laughing on the front and then kind of go into a message at the end. I like that. Yeah. I'll say if you can touch your head, heart and hands, give them something to think about, something to feel, and something to go do, then you've kind of done your job there. And the thing I like about sword swallowing too, man, it's it's universal. The, the language of what in the world is going on is so powerful. And that's where the one drawback to being a, a, a stand-up who speaks one language is, is not having that universal reach, like some, you know, you know whether it's a sword swallow or somebody that juggles flames it's just like such an attention getter and i'm sure when you go to some of these small villages people are like what is this and they're going to listen <laughs> to whatever you have to say you know hopefully they act on it but at least you've got their attention and like you say adding a little comedy in there too is just a icing on the cake the, uh, the comedy works better in english-speaking uh audiences but the swords so and you touched on it just a minute ago uh, I studied hypnosis and I got certified as an NGH hypnotist and never really used it much uh, in my show. I didn't end up doing any comedy hypnotism shows. But what I learned from hypnosis is we as as comedians, as speakers, you have three audiences out there. When you sit in front of an audience or you stand in front of an audience of several hundred people, you've got three audiences. One is your visual audience. They want to see things. They want to see the fire and the swords, and they want to see visual stuff. Number two audience is the audio audience. They want to hear things in their ears and think things in their head. And number three is the kinesthetic. So V-A-K, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. And the kinesthetic folks, they want to feel something. They want to go to a movie and cry or feel surprised or, or really kind of touched. And so I like to use all three of those. So the first third of my show, I do a lot of visual and comedy and entertainment. 
The second third, I do a little bit more educational, more of the TED Talk, where I throw in the the, uh, the education, the history of sword swallowing, the, the medical, where the sword goes in the body. And then number three is I go for more of the kinesthetic and, and kind of zing them a little bit. And Rick, you would be surprised. I do a lot of state fairs and county fairs. And uh, when I come, come off the stage from doing a fair, people will come up. I'll sign autographs for an hour, but people will come up with tears in their eyes. And they'll say, yeah, the sword swallowing is great. But your backstory about your fears and overcoming that and what God's done in your life, that just really touched me because as a little kid, I had fears, I had dreams, I had blah, blah, blah. And they tell me their story. And it's amazing that even at a state fair where I'm not given a gospel message at all, people come up with tears in their eyes and it will impact their lives. And so I love being able to use all three of those and kind of mix the three of them together and impact people visually, auditorially, or educationally and then kinesthetically in the heart so yeah that's for me that's a big deal to try and hit all three audiences yeah well it's funny that a lot of times people really are looking for something else and you know there's definitely people are skeptical of seeing any entertainer like what's this guy doing how's this guy make a living at this but they're really saying how can i do something exceptional in their brain and they're just discounting the fact that you're on stage because they can't do it and then the other thing that it reminds me of is uh, I don't know where I picked this up in the past couple of years, but the saying that sell them what they want, but give them what they need. And so they want entertainment, but they didn't even realize they needed that message until you spoke directly to them. And with comedy or any kind of entertainment, the, uh, you know, the stunts are one thing, the stories are one thing, but the emotions are what really connect people. And I think a lot of, especially beginning comics kind of miss out on what emotion should I be delivering this joke with? And what, how do I connect with the audience that way? It's not just I'm the same age as this audience, but we've all gone through this thing together or at different points. And that's a great way to connect with folks. I don't like to be an entertainer that just goes up there and does trick, trick, trick. I'm up here to show off. I'm up here to get, get applause from you and get laughter from you. You can go out there and do tricks, whether it's juggling tricks or fire tricks or yo-yo tricks or, or comedy, you know, laughs and get people to laugh. But if you can impact them in a deeper way where they come back again and again, that means there's a little bit more to it than just I'm doing a trick and showing off. You know what I mean? But my show has evolved completely from when I first do it, started doing it. I really worked on being able to work in a little bit of my backstory without being too heavy and being able to structure my whole show. And um, kind of what I alluded to both in my TED Talks and in my stage shows and in my comedy is I try and set up my show based on the principle of three, uh, the power of three. The first third of my show is visual. The second third is more educational. And the, thir the third third is more impact and kind of to the heart, to the, to the mind, to, you know, really impact people. And uh, I just lost where I was going with that. But yeah, I, I decided to take it so that in the very beginning of my show, when I first started out in 2002, 2003, I was just doing tricks. And I realized I had to put some kind of structure in there, put in an obstacle that my character had to overcome. Mm. And so I start out with, you know, at first I was, I would try and convince people, Hey, sword swelling is really real. This is, I'm serious. This is really real. These are real swords. And I would do that and swallow 12, 15 swords in my show. And by the time I'd get done, I'd get 98% of the people to believe it was real. I'd take them from non-belief to belief in sword swallowing. Uh, but I'd always have somebody come up after the show and go, come on, let me see the swords. I know they're fake. I know they fold up in the handle. They curl up. They got to be fake. And I'd usually walk out to my car. I'd throw the, my bag of swords down on the, and I'd pull one out and I'd say, here, look at this. Is that a real solid steel, steel sword, 24 inches? Yeah, it is. I'd swallow it and make them pull it out. So then I realized I'm going to do kind of a paradigm shift already at the beginning. So now when I start out my shows, I'll ask, show of hands, how many of you have never seen a real life sword sweller before? And 98% of the audience will raise their hand. And I'll say, how many of you think it's really real? Oh, you poor gullible people. How many of you think it's fake? How many of you think you know what the trick is? And people will raise their hands and I'll say, come on, you all know it's fake, right? You can't really swallow a sword without slitting your throat. You can't really impale yourself without spilling your guts. Everybody knows sword swelling is like 99% impossible and you can't really do the impossible now, can you? Or can you? 
So watch carefully, watch my fingers, watch my lips, watch my throat, see if you can figure out what the trick really is. So then they're leaning on, on the edge of their seats and I will go through a couple of fake swords first. I do a curl up sword and this is where the power of three comes in, kind of works with joke structure. Uh, I've learned that with a lot of joke structure, I've learned a lot of this from you and from Michael Jr. and from comedy classes that I've taken. But joke structure is often you know, set up a premise, set up A, set up B, and then the audience thinks you're going to go to C and you go to Z or mm -hmm. Q or something really weird they don't expect. Or in, I, I sometimes think of it as one, two, Z. You give them something that's just totally unexpected. So I do that not only in the jokes in the first third of my show, but also in my segments. I will do, just like you as a comedian, will do a segment on one topic. Let's say it's shopping or the mall or Walmart or getting on a plane. You might have different modules. Well, I have different sword modules. And my first module, um, I... I take them kind of through the history of sword swallowing. So I start out with a sword from India called an Uday sword. And in India, they call a sword Kathi. We get the word cut from that, but Kathi. And so I start with this sword and I put a big dramatic buildup on it that if you're squeamish, you might not want to watch kind of thing. This is not recommended for impressionable children who might try this at home. So ladies, you might want to cover your husband's eyes. Right. And that gets a little joke. And I do this first sword and I do it with no music. And I make a lot of sound effects with my, you know, I make my stomach go in and out and I'm doing kind of, kind of making a lot of noise and people are gagging in their seats. <laughs> and I, and the, the one, two, three setup is number one is I put the sword down with all the sound effects. Number two, I pull it back out. Number three, I, I hold it up like this very triumphantly and they clap. So I get my one, my two, and as they're clapping, I thrust it up in the air and it curls up on me. And so there's the unexpected twist, mm -hmm. the kind of the paradigm shift, the, the surprise element. And so then they laugh like, ah, you know, and they, and they kind of backfires on me. So I do the self-deprecating -depre mm -hmm. failure kind of thing, the sword fake, you know. All right, show of hands, how many of you believe this is a real fake sword? And that real fake line gets yeah. them because they're going, they're thinking I'm going to say a real sword. I say a real fake sword. And they have to think about it and then kind of a double negative and they, they, they all kind of slowly raise their hand. Come on, this is like a tape measure, right? So th that's my first module. My second module, I then I say, well, from India, sword swelling moved north to China about a thousand years later, and I take out a Chinese Tai Chi sword. And I turn sideways and I swallow it with the sword going behind my head. And they're they're thinking it's real and I do it very convincingly. And then I turn and wink at them while I'm holding the sword like this. And they laugh because there's that surprise element. So I do a one, two, three on that one. It's down and then, you know, I pull it out and, and I wink at them and they think, okay. So then I do it down the front, put the sword down is one, pull it out is two. And they all applaud. And then I lean the sword on a table and it collapses up into the hilt. So they laugh again. So I've fooled them twice. They thought they were real swords and they're actually fake swords. So there's where the paradigm shift is. The, the surprise. And so by this time they think, and I can hear the audience, they're all saying, I knew it. I knew it was fake. I knew it curled up. I knew it fold up. So I have to get those out of the way first. So then my third module, and as a comedian, you'll, you understand this when you do a one and a two. And then my third sword, I take out about a 15 inch dagger sword. And, um, I do the, the whole ex explanation that change the music. It's pretty heavy, kind of scary. And um, so I will take out an orange and I'll say something about impale my body of flesh and blood with this sword of solid steel. And I impale the orange with it. As I pull the sword out of the orange, I hold the sword up and I sit with my right hand and I say, OK, now how many of you believe this is a real? And as I'm saying that their hands are going up, they believe it's a real sword. And I hold up the orange. How many of you believe this is a real orange? And they all laugh because it's unexpected because I've set up in module one, mm -hmm. real fake sword, module two, real fake sword, module three, it's a real orange. Is that making sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like it in a lot of ways because it does have the classic setup, setup, you know, setup, premise, setup, punch, but it also has the rule of threes. And you kind of alluded close to what, what I call it. It's a, 
truth, truth, twist, or fact, fact, false, but you do false, false, fact, which is still a, a three. And the third time, they're, they're just a sure fire. This has got to be a fake sword, and it turned out to be the real one. So I like the fact that you connected with their skepticism on the front end, just like a comic would come out and connect with, you know, hey, if it's a small crowd, hey, we could have done this in my shower or in the bus right over here, you know, just to connect on what is the moment and then take them on a journey. And through that, they go on a journey through your journey, which I just think is the best best kind of performance there is because they, they wind up somewhere different than where they started and definitely, almost usually, different than they thought they would end up. So it's, it's just just a fun way to do it. And plus, you're getting the message across and depending on the venue, an even bigger message. So I think that's awesome. Swords. You thought you were coming to see a, a show on sword swing. It's really not about the swords. It's about me finding my purpose and calling and which is helping other people find their purpose and calling and inspiring you to become superheroes and do the impossible in your life. And so the big twist is, is a big what I call a UPS, an unexpected paradigm shift. And in most TED Talks, you have a setup, setup, and then this unexpected paradigm shift. And it's like, whoa, we didn't expect that. This is not what, how we thought it would end. But I say the whole show is not about showing off with swords or doing the impossible. It's about finding your purpose and calling. And mine is to help you find yours. What is your purpose? What is your calling? What is your superpower? What, are you, what were you put here on earth to do? And people are kind of looking up like, wow, what was I put here to do? And so there's another, it's a a bigger, deeper, you know, on a bigger scale. My whole show is one big joke. It's fake swords, real swords. And then uh, for churches, sword of the spirit kind of thing. And like, wow. And so people will come up afterwards and say, man, the sword swing is great, but the message was even better. I didn't expect that. I was expecting this to be cheesy or funny. And so I kind of hit them on, on all three aspects. And so. That's where I, I use your premise of, of par, uh, set up, set up, twist, or paradigm shift, as I call it with TED Talks. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems to work really well on the big picture and then implement those little rule of three all the way through the show as well. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating, too, just about the kind of the formula of that is is people know the formula. I mean, th- when you go see a movie, you know that there's, you know, how it's going to go, but you st- because it's such a tried and true way that our brain works in discovery of different things and hiding some facts and then revealing some facts later, we're so drawn to story. So, you know, amongst everything else, you're, you're a true storyteller in that sense and that you have a journey and an arc and obstacles to overcome and they come along with that. If, if any of your comedians are working on structuring their show, my advice for you would be not just do a show that's just joke, 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 and it's funny, funny, funny. Come Start out with you know, what is my obstacle? Where do I want to go? Where, where is my goals as a person? And at the end of your show, end up with that, but have a few major twists in there as well. And if you listen to Matthew's book, uh, Story Worthy, hopefully you'll, you'll pick some of that out of there and you can kind of do a bigger structure with your show. It makes it really good. I think there's so much more we can offer as performers. And I think that's the difference between a transformational performer and just somebody that's out there entertaining is uh, the entertainers kind of pumping themselves up the whole time and ends on a big thing that shows how great they are. Whereas a transformational speaker, entertainer, sword swallower, comedian uh, takes the, the audience and lets th- I kind of like them to be the, sh- the star of the show towards the end or them the focus. Uh, even, even in my corporate events, I bring somebody up and make them the focus at the end so that they're all talking about him and they kind of forget about me. That's fine with me. That was my goal. You know, I, I was, I got all the attention for 50 minutes, but for 10, this guy's a rock star and he's going to be known as this guy for the rest of the time he works there. So I'm with you on, and it doesn't it just make it more fun to perform knowing that s- somebody else is going to benefit besides you. I mean, that, that makes it worth showing up for, makes worth staying afterwards for. And it's, it's what I miss the most right now, not being able to do it as much as I like. Yep. For me in my show, towards the end of my show, my, my final big deal is I will pick somebody in the audience that I've been picking on, usually a blonde, who's covering her eyes, who's squeamish, who can't watch. And I'll come down and I'll bring her up on stage and I'll let her do the impossible. And of course, everybody thinks she's going to swallow a sword. No, she's not. But then I have her pull a sword out of my throat and she gets all the applause. I ask the audience to, to applaud for her. Sometimes they will get up there and I'll build it up so much that they'll get tears in their eyes or... Almost, I had one gal wet her pants. She was just so scared she was going to kill me. 
And everybody was scared for her. She's shaking, trembling. And uh, she's like, oh, I don't want to kill you. You know, can we do a run through? <laughs> yeah, don't run it through anything. <laughs> so I get her to pull the sword out. When she pulls it out and she holds it up, the audience applauds for her that she has done the impossible, something she never expected to do. She's the big hero. But then I do my final twist where it's not about me. It's not about the swords. It's not about her. It's actually about, you know, if for my church audiences, for what is God going to do? You know, what does he have you here on earth? What is your purpose and calling? You know, and I kind of give him the glory and let him uh, get the, the the spotlight at the end of my Christian shows, at least. And it, it and then I can walk away and I, you know, I feel really good about it because I've had fun. And yeah, the swords work. I know the swords are going to work every time. I don't know if my words are going to work or the jokes are going to work, but uh, it, it makes for a fun show. And that's where people call you back year after year, you know, show after show. And it makes it a lot of fun for me to be able to impact people's lives in that way. Well, I definitely want to let people know about your website. I like to play on words in your <laughs> title, a cutting edge inner i n n e r com. they can find out all kinds of stuff about you there and watch uh, some videos click over to your ted talk i'll put all that stuff in the show notes uh as we wrap up i would like to get and I, i've been trying to, to remember to do this more often but as we wrap up is there a thought or a mindset or a piece of advice that you would give to new performers new entertainers who whether it's something extreme like sword swallowing or uh you know the fear of public speaking, how they overcome that. What's, what's a piece of advice they can take and and use? Give them something that they can take home. I don't just try to get, you know, laughs all the way through the show. I do because that makes it entertaining, but what can you give them? What nugget, what piece of meat can you give them? So I always distill everything down at the end of my show. And I say, you know, it's not about the, I told you when I started, it was I wanted to travel the world and visit all these destinations, wanted to climb mountains, wanted to do the impossible, wanted to be a superhero like Superman and fly around the world doing superhuman feats and saving lives. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. It's not about the mountain. It's about the climb. It's not about the treasure. It's about the hunt, the quest. It's not about the end product. In other words, it's not about doing tricks. It's about the process you go through and, and what kind of what you've learned out of it. So I try and give them my little synopsis at the end and give them a um, piece of meat, a nugget, something that they can use and take home as a takeaway in their lives. And if you do that, um, your shows will come off a lot better. You've got a structure in your shows and it'll be a lot more fun for you. Yeah. You know, as I'm listening to that, it kind of seems to me like, you know, not to boil your life down to three sentences, but you know, initially you want to see the world. And then as you perform, you want the world to see you. But in your show, you want the audience to see themselves at the end. It's like just an interesting way to, of self-discovery and then teaching them how to discover themselves in the process, which is just a, a cool, cool thing for people to go through. So very cool, man. I know we're uh, kind of in a lockdown type situation where we're not out there and performing as much as we want. But if anybody is listening, uh, mm-hmm. is putting on events, uh, doing church outreach events, any of those things, know somebody that works uh, fairs, festivals, corporate events, uh, make sure you check out Cutting Edge Inner, I-N-N-E-R-Tainment.com. You can learn more how to book Dan on that site and uh, learn more about Dan as well. And I hope people do visit and learn more and uh, visit the links on the show notes page too. Dan, it's been a lot of fun, man. I'm sorry we didn't get to meet while we were here in Nashville at the same time, but glad we got to do this today. We'll, we'll get you out here to Phoenix, uh, or I'll, I'll run into you next time I'm back in Nashville. Sounds good, man. Thank you. Awesome. Hope you enjoyed that. Oh, yeah, man. Sorry, I just, I didn't swallow a sword. I just had a protein shake, and man, that is some sidewalky chalky stuff right there. Uh, man, so I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dan Meyer. Uh, you're going to want to check out his website, Cutting Edge I-N-N-E-R-tainment, entertainment.com is where you can find out more about him. Uh, click on the show notes link if you like, and I'll have his uh, TED Talk on there. You can click on that, see some videos, uh, see the man behind all of the accomplishments and all of the motivation. You know, Game of Thrones. I never even heard about a throne before this, and now I'm, I'm kind of mad I don't have any. I guess I have ideas and goals, but I've never combined them into... Uh, you know, not things that weren't financial or family based, but just like I want to wake up in a different country. I want to see a sunset somewhere like that. It's pretty cool. Game of Thrones. 
you know, when I was thinking of titles for this podcast, there was a billion that went through my head, obviously, with a sword swallow, hard act to swallow, things like that. <laughs> but uh, Thrones was the thing that stuck out to me. So I hope it stuck out to you. And I hope if you swallow a sword, it doesn't stick out anywhere it's not supposed to. Don't try this at home, kids. Incredible. Dan Meyer. All right, that's going to do it for me. I would like to thank again our Patreon supporter for this episode. It's Lauren Ainsley. Lauren, thank you for continuing to sponsor the podcast. Hope things are going well in your comedy career. Uh, shoot me an email if I can do anything for you. If you'd like to sponsor the podcast through Patreon, which is uh, just a way to set up a, a donation is what Patreon is. It's kind of like an online tip jar. You can do a one-time donation, no strings attached, just, hey, buddy, like your podcast, here's a few bucks. Or if you want to have some strings attached, nothing wrong with that. I've got bonuses and rewards for you if you donate at different levels. Uh, you can check that out at schooloflaughs.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. For as little $7 a month or three fifty dollars a podcast, you can get a uh, membership in a year-long Club 52, which puts an email in your inbox each week with one small actionable but impactful task you can apply to your stand-up comedy career or your speaking career to get bigger, better, and more bookable. That's going to do it for this one. I'll talk to you guys soon. All right. Talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaughs.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay money. Stay money.